Good morning, everybody. I can see you all coming in now. Um, we will start in literally one minute. Um, so I am Anne Sharp, the Marketing Manager for Hireright, and I am just here to manage this webinar on behalf of Caroline Smith, um, our VP De uh, Deputy General Counsel. Um, who I will be handing over to in a minute. Um, just a couple of housekeeping uh, rules for everybody. Uh, we are keeping everybody on mute uh, for throughout the uh, presentation here. Uh, if you do have a question at all, please feel free to pop it into the Q&A box at the bottom. I will be monitoring that, so I will be answering any questions that I can answer if they're housekeeping questions. Any legal questions, though, we will leave to the end, and then I will be presenting those questions to Caroline at the end of the, the webinar. So, with no further ado, let me hand straight over to Caroline to kick off today's webinar. Thanks, Anne, for the intro, and thanks all of you for taking time out of your day to talk about my personal favourite topic, which is compliance in EMEA and India. Now, before we get into um, the, the main um, bulk of the presentation, I've been told that I have to present this high right legal notice, which is the best slide in here. Um, and essentially, it's just reminding everyone that anything you hear today is for informational purposes only. This isn't intended to be comprehensive, and this is not a substitute for, or should it be construed as legal advice or opinion. So let's get into the agenda. So such is my love of compliance. It was a little bit tricky to pick just a few topics to cover because um, the world of privacy literally never stands still for long. And there have been a lot of new laws either being brought into force or being proposed. So today we're going to use the first part of the session to cover some compliance updates across the region with a quick view of emerging laws relating to AI. And then we're going to focus on one of HireRight's new products, which is social media. And just as a reminder, as Anne said, if you do have any questions, then um, you have the Q&A chat box, and I'm sure an AI-generated robot, aka Anne, um, will pick them up so I can answer those at the end of the presentation, should there be time. So let's get into it. So we're going to stay on home turf to begin with, so let's take a quick look at the UK. So having left the EU, the UK has a degree of freedom in respect to how it develops its privacy laws going forwards though always bearing in mind the desire to remain adequate in the eyes of the EU. And the UK's regulator, the Information Commissioner, or the ICO, has always had a clear manifesto based off pragmatism and proportionality. Rights and protections of personal data are critical, but the ICO wants to ensure that focus is given to the most serious risks presented to the public, whilst also adopting measures that are aimed at supporting economic growth via the use of new technologies in an increasingly data-driven world. The ICO also states that it's its job to make sure that it can provide business with advice and guidance on how data protection laws, and in particular practical guidance, on how to meet obligations in response to those new requirements and initiatives are presented in a timely manner so that those businesses can succeed. As you can see in the red box there, the ICO wants to have simple, clear, business-friendly frameworks that allow flexibility in respect to compliance with data laws, which is all welcome news um, for businesses. And we can definitely see this approach being taken in some of the recent guidance issued by the ICO, so the use of artificial intelligence and privacy in the product design lifecycle, but also in the work that it's done with the UK government on the redraft of the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill number two. So we're going to focus on that bill um, today. But by way of history, the first version of the bill, number one, was paused back in September so that ministers could rethink their approach and engage in a co-design process with businesses, with the promise that bill number two would become more tailored, bespoke and business friendly and set up a British system of data protection. The question is, is it truly those things? And in any event, regardless of that, what are the highlights that we see in context of background screening? And there's lots of changes but I've picked out just four areas of interest um, to talk about today. Two of them relate to audit, by which I mean those audits that you as our customers, prospective customers, will carry out on um, HireEye or any other data processor. Um, one related to lawful grants of processing, and then another relating to product. So tackling the audit point first, whenever we face a customer order, audit from a customer, um, obviously, we are asked two things. Firstly, who is your DPO? 
And secondly, can you show us your record of processing in the format provided by X regulator? And obviously we're asked far more questions than that. It'd be great if it was just those two, but those are the ones that are recurrent in every single um, um, sort of audit that we get. Now, bill number two addresses both of those questions. So firstly, the concept of the DPO is actually being abolished under bill number two and is instead being replaced with something called a senior responsible individual. But reading the text, it isn't actually a massive change in context as the role does seem uncannily similar to the DPO role. But what it does mean is that UK based companies will have to look at the responses that they provide to these questions and alter them according to where they happen to be processing the data or in fact respond to both um, depending. And of course, your audit questions would have to be updated as well to cover that point off. The second piece about audit is that the generic requirement to keep a record of processing is actually being abolished. However, you'll still need to have that record of processing if you undertake high risk processing. Unfortunately, that isn't actually defined under bill number two, but in good news and going back to the idea that the ICO is pragmatic, that guidance is actually going to come from the ICO. So we can really hope that that stated aim of pragmatism and reviewing real risks carries through here so that the burden on the record of processing is actually hugely reduced for companies. But actually looking at the reality, most processes are going to be processing data subjects to the GDPR as well as bill number two or the UK GDPR. So I think records of processing are probably here to stay and will have to be maintained. But thankfully, the high right platform generates those records of processing for every single individual that's screened. And that can then be consolidated into management information reports and appended to those regulator approved templates. So in any event, regardless of what happens, fulfilling that requirement should remain pretty straightforward and not too burdensome. Looking at changes in relation to lawful grounds of processing, Bill number two really focuses in on legitimate interests and actually now sets out predefined legitimate interests whereby no further assessment is going to be needed by an organisation um, before commencing processing if that legitimate interest is set out in, uh, and predefined. And that's all drafted in an annex that is currently available for everybody to see. Um, however, don't get too excited as people in the recruitment space, because unfortunately, employment generally and background screening specifically is not included in that annex number one. That being said, bill number two does actually go some way to actually providing some more examples of what's meant by a legitimate interest. So there's some some examples within the legislation itself. Um, again, doesn't actually specifically spell out employment or pre-employment checks. But perhaps we might start to see some more examples added or we might get to see some guidance from the ICO on the point, especially because it seems to be there's much more focus on legitimate interests and trying to clarify um, for businesses what that actually means and how it should be used. And then finally, and I think probably most interesting for higher right, is that bill number two contains provisions that relate specifically to digital verifications. We've seen um, in the last year the adoption of digital DBS products and digital right to work products. And we know that digital verification is a really important tool, but there's actually no existing legislation that relates to the regulation of private organisations that provide those digital verification services in the UK. Enter stage left, bill number two, with the aim of increasing trust in acceptance of digital identities across the UK. Now, the provisions are designed to support making identity proofing easier, cheaper and more secure and to enable a trusted digital identity market to develop in the UK for those that choose it to prove things about themselves. And one of the examples in the paper that supports bill number two is for those folk who are starting a new job and want to share their credentials. So that's great news for background screening. Bill number two establishes a regulatory framework for the provision of digital verification services in the UK and also enables public authorities to disclose personal information to those trusted digital verification service providers for the purposes of identity and eligibility verification. And that's important because one without the other is slightly pointless. It's no, no good having a framework uh, approving digital verification providers and then not allowing um, those public authorities to then disclose that information to them. So that's really important that it's balanced. Just as a quick side note, um, bill number two is definitely not replacing the UK GDPR or the PECR. It's all going to be complementary legislation and those two pieces are going to continue to provide our legal framework that we operate in today.
So scampering over to Europe, we're going to look at three topics. So the first is going to be the so-called European data strategy. Then we're going to look at data transfers and then also legislation and guidance, um, imaginatively referred to as other interesting updates. So let's look at the European data strategy. What is that? Well, it's made up of three main pieces of legislation, being the AI Act, which we're going to cover later in more detail, plus the EU Data Governance Act and the EU Data Act. All previous data laws focused on personal data, but the emphasis of the EU Data Governance Act and the EU Data Act is that regulation of data is not just limited to personal data, it includes non-personal data too, with the main theme being to facilitate that access and sharing of personal data and non-personal data at a B2B and a B2C level. Now that all sounds great, straightforward enough, but the reason I wanted to talk about this is because I think it's quite interesting context of current laws and the approach that we currently take to anonymization, so the depersonalization of personal data and we know that it's incredibly tricky at the moment to implement any measures um, around true anonymization. So on the one hand, when um, the GDPR came into force, we had guidance that suggested that anonymization could be done on a risk-based approach, um, basically meaning that the process of anonymization in and of itself will always allow for the outside risk that that data can in theory be re-identified at a later date. However, in the same piece of guidance, it was also stated that all raw data would have to be destroyed, which doesn't seem to make sense if you're taking a risk-based approach. And the European Data Protection Supervisor also focused on the fact that to truly anonymize data, the techniques that led to that anonymization could never be reversed. And that means in practice that it was really genuinely impossible to ever anonymize data truly. So if it is impossible, under the current guidance to anonymize data, how can legislation such as the EU Data Act cover non-personal data? Because by definition, personal data can't be anonymized or it's difficult to anonymize it. So how does it become non-personal data? Um, but having read lots of articles on this point, um, the EU Data Act actually probably gives us some salvation and clarification around what that guidance may look like in the future around anonymization, which is important for everybody, whether you're processing data in accordance with the EU Data Act or under the GDPR. And the reason for this is that the Data Act applies to data that's referred to as usage data. And that's data that's got value for users or third parties who might want to use that data to improve their operations or their services. Under the current legislation, because that data is used to learn things about individuals, i.e. improve operations, services, then it's defined as personal data by purpose. And that was the Article 29 Working Party who defined it as such. So that means that non-personal data, which is user data, and this personal data by purpose are kind of one and the same thing. And so the only way that the EU Data Act can work in effect is and allow um, organizations to actually process that non-personal data to learn things about individuals to improve their operations is if we revert to that original recommendation of a risk-based approach to anonymization, i.e. accepting that there's always an inherent risk that that data can be re-identified at some point. And as I say, that is really important when we look at how we store records under the GDPR and allows us a little bit more flexibility, we hope, in respect to anonymization. However, the European Data Protection Board are still in the process of issuing guidance on the point. So as of now, we don't really know what the outcome is going to be in respect to that anonymization. Data transfers. So if you're anything like me, the trauma of the Schrems cases continues to be felt, but we do have some positive movements in respect to data transfers. And that was an intentional weak legal pun. But before we cover the EU-US data privacy framework, it's worth noting that signatories to the Section 108 Plus Convention are gathering the pace, and France has become the 22nd country to ratify. And the reason that we're drawing this out for everyone's attention is that we think it's quite important to bear this convention in mind because it allows non-EU countries to sign up to protocols on the protection of personal data. Now, it isn't quite an adequacy ruling, but the jurisdictions that are signed up to that Section 108 plus convention do provide some greater opportunity to organisations when they consider where they want to process or store data. 
And the reason for that is that when we're all conducting our international data transfer impact assessments, which we've all done recently, organisations have to consider once we've established that those transfers are necessary, whether or not those transfers are outside the EU EEA or an adequate third country, what supplementary measures are we going to put in place to further protect that data? So we know about standard contractual clauses and the European Data Protection Board also suggested that supplementary technical and security measures were put in place. But when we're analysing where to put data, jurisdictions being signed up to that Section 108 plus convention can also be considered as providing some degree of additional safeguarding of data in addition to those other methodologies. So it does allow us to build a slightly more flexible approach to where data may be used and, and utilise um, you know, sort of language assistance when we're processing data, data etc. There's only 16 more countries left to go before the convention goes live. So we'll be sort of ticking those off um, like bingo as we go. Um, now, moving on to the more solemn topic of the EU-US data privacy framework or the DPF. You may be aware that in April of this year, the DPF suffered a setback when 37 out of the 58 MEPs, if I've got my maths right, passed a resolution objecting to the revised framework that had been approved by the EU Commission. Now, despite this, the Commission has moved pretty quickly. And at the end of June, they issued a revised draft of the DPF and presented that to the Article 93 Committee. Now, all of this is pretty much shrouded in mystery for the moment because the committee wasn't asked to give any opinions at the time during that meeting on that new draft. But unfortunately, the draft isn't publicly available. However, we do know what the MEPs objected to. So I think we're quite safe in some knowledge of what that new version of the DPF is going to address. So to recap, some of the issues that the MEPs noted were that whilst it was an improvement on the, the original draft, the MEP still felt it created issues in respect to safeguarding personal data, and they gave a couple of examples. One was around objections to bulk collection of personal data, and a lot of the concerns were around the independence of the established Data Protection Review Court in the US, which was felt to not operate as an independent body because its judgments could be overruled by the president. However, with 37 MEPs voting against the, the, old, the previous version of the DPF and the other 21 abstaining, this new draft does need to be pretty convincing, I think, for it to change those opinions and quickly. And we're all hoping for that uh, uh, framework to be put in place. Moving on to some um, legislation and guidance, the other interesting topics, um, digital identity has also been at the forefront of the EU's mind, as well as in the UK. And just at the end of June, the EU Council and Parliament reached a provisional political agreement on core elements of a new framework for a European digital identity. So that's access for people and business to electronic identification and authentication via a digital wallet held on your phone. Now, the proposal is going to require member states to issue digital wallets under a notified EID scheme built on common technical standards following a compulsory certification. And in addition to, to this proposal, it was also recommended by both that something called a union toolbox um, is developed defining what the technical specifications of the wallet would be to ensure that there is consistency. And we're gonna be reading much more into this topic with interest and there will be a lot more to come in respect to this, but it certainly um, will be helpful when it comes to fruition in the um, background screening realm when we look at identity and um, being able to access things like um, employment and education documents. In France, CNIL issued updates um, on its guidance on the security of personal data. And um, some of those updates allow for greater flexibility. So for example, there was new recommendations on passwords, which did allow for that greater freedom. And um, there's also updates to tracing operations and managing incidents. There's also some more information being added to the guide in relation to framework for IT development, securing exchanges and other organisations, and encrypting hashing or signing, which is my personal favourite and is very exciting. We've also got probably in terms of background screening and an impact in the here and now, some really interesting developments that have come out of Germany. And those developments relate to the lawful grounds of processing personal data in the context of employment. So in Germany, many employers rely on Section 26 of the Federal Data Protection Act of 2017, 
as the ground for processing employment data, as opposed to one of those outlined in Article 6 of the GDPR. Now, Section 26 specifically permits processing of personal data for, for employment purposes if the processing is necessary to enter, perform and or terminate an employment relationship or to perform a collective agreement. So it can be relied on for pre-employment screening. However, in a case relating to the processing of personal data of teachers, it's inherent in live streaming of classes, i.e. during COVID, which was brought against the Hessian Ministry of Education, the European Court of Justice at the end of March determined that in fact Section 29 could not be relied upon. And as a result of this, the Hamburg Commissioner for Data Protection and Freedom of Information issued a press release. And they highlighted that in their view, businesses needed to consider what the, a new um, lawful ground of processing, and they considered that Article 6.1 of the GDPR should be specifically relied upon, and that is contractual necessity and compliance with a legal obligation. Now, this is just one state regulator's view, and it is really interesting that they've picked out just one of the many Article 6 lawful grounds of processing, as it's quite restrictive as compared to Article 26, though I guess that's kind of partly the point. But looking at this through a really narrow lens, those German employers that screen in the regulated space are probably sitting quite pretty at the moment because there are laws that are going to require some degree of pre-employment pre vetting to establish qualifications and whether an individual has a fit and proper background. So for example, in financial services and to the European Banking Association standards and the German regulations as well. But outside of that, what does contractual necessity mean? Well, we don't really know, to be honest. Um, but questions that kind of sprang to my mind are, you know, is that going to be limited to processing only data needed to keep on an employee file? Or could it perhaps extend to requirements baked into an employment contract? So do employers need to review those contracts and perhaps bring in terms to state that screening is required in order for the contract to be validated or a probationary period to be passed? I don't know the answers to that. They're just sort of thoughts. But also, will other regulators agree with the opinion of the Hamburg regulator, or will they be a little bit more flexible and determine that actually you can look at some of the other Article 6 grounds of processing? In any event, regardless of all of this and my musings, it's a development that's worth watching, and it's worth any employer who screens in Germany, um, it's worth them reviewing information notices that you have in place currently. And of course, we're also going to be working on a revised version of our standard that can be used on accounts, should anybody wish to, um, where those accounts are set up with German packages. So we are going to round up the EMEA portion of our compliance, up, compliance update with Africa and the Middle East. And it's here that we're seeing perhaps the most amount of activity in the privacy space in relation to new or proposed legislation or updates to existing legislation. And you can see this slide is pretty busy with, um, with updates, and this is just a sort of snapshot of some of the most interesting ones. We've got a couple of thoughts on these. Um, I'm going to kind of do this in reverse order. So we're going to start with, with Israel. Now, Israel's issued a public consultation on processing ID numbers, and we're going to be watching that with real interest. There are a lot of restrictions already in Israel when it comes to processing personal data for recruitment purposes and privacy and employment laws don't allow, for example, processing of credit or criminal data. So further restrictions on ID will definitely pose some challenges, in particular because ID um, is always used as a really strong identifier and becomes even stronger if you're actually validating that the ID is a, is a proper ID. And from a risk perspective for um, organizations that are hiring, in particular in growth areas like IT out in Israel, it doesn't seem terribly practical to place those restrictions on ID processing. But as I say, we don't really know what, what the consultation is going to come out with, what those restrictions will relate to, um, and whether it will still be able to, to actually um, process that data. But perhaps a solution to look at is utilizing digital identity verification tools that will allow that instant verification without the need to upload and retain documents on systems. We're going to look at Saudi Arabia, and we were expecting a little bit of razzmatazz in March when that new legislation was meant to come into force. So um, I felt a little bit confused when absolutely nothing materialised and I, I had FOMO and thought I'd missed out. Um, but fear not, the new laws have just been delayed a little bit and they're now going to come into force on the 14th of September. And all organisations will have a further one year grace period granted to allow companies in Saudi Arabia to comply. 
we need to double check whether those entities outside of Saudi will still have the extra five years in which they need to comply. Um, but we're, we're just monitoring that at the moment. Now, the delay in the implementation of the law was down to the fact that the law had to be amended in parts. And thankfully, one of those amendments did relate to the um, rules around data transfers. So the original legislation created, in effect, localization rules. And whilst it is still a little bit difficult to decipher the precise amendments purely from the English translations I've got access to, because they're certainly not official translations, it is looking hopeful in the space of data transfers, i.e. that this, these amendments provide a little bit more flexibility because the legislation now does allow transfers to achieve certain purposes. Now, we think that those certain purposes are going to be further defined by the regulator, and we're going to be looking out for any updates that clarify what this actually means. But should there, that certain purpose be achieved, then conditions also have to be met. And those are that the transfer doesn't prejudice national security or vital interests of the kingdom. The country to which the data is transferred protects the data to the same standard as the kingdom and that any transfer is limited to a minimum amount of personal data. So hopefully the UK and the EU will be deemed safe places um, due to our existing legislative framework of which Saudi actually took quite a lot of inspiration. And in relation to transferring the minimum amount of personal data, we already as an organisation at High Right have those protocols in place across the board to ensure that we're only ever transferring the data that is required to return accurate results. So it's minimum, minimal by definition. And additionally, we of course hope that background checks of individuals who are going to work in the kingdom will be considered as protecting the vital interests of the kingdom as opposed to the opposite, and perhaps even seen as um, you know, boosting the, the kingdom's economy as they continue to develop out um, their new mega cities. It is going to be really interesting to see how this will be interpreted and we'll, as I say, we'll be watching this. But I do just want to share a top Google transfers to Saudi Arabia, because if you do, you are going to end up down some rabbit hole of sporting analysis about the summer transfer window in the UK and all the Premier League stars going to Saudi Arabia and what that means for the beautiful game. I lost many hours to that yesterday. I know things now that I never thought I needed to know. Um, moving to Africa. Um, you can see here in Algeria, Nigeria, Tanzania, we've got new laws either just come into force or about to come into force. And in Cameroon, we have got some public comments requested on draft laws. Um, and this is important um, and will hopefully drive digitization of records in Africa. Because as many of you know on this webinar, if you're doing any screening in Africa, it can be a real challenge to get records because they're paper based and they're not held centrally. Now, one of the um, positive impacts of the pandemic um, certainly amongst African nations and other nations, is that it really drove home that data is critical to the global economy and the easy processing and access of that data is key. And to facilitate that, records absolutely need to be digitised when you can't actually physically go out and access those records. And robust privacy laws are generally recognised as being an essential component of achieving that digitisation. So as I say, for those of us in the background screening space, that's us as providers or you guys as consumers of those checks, the more records that we see digitized, the better, as that will drive quicker and better results. So we're going to leave Amir behind and now have a quick look at India and the privacy bill and the impact on, on background screening. Now, India released its updated privacy bill late last year in November. And it replaces the much maligned Personal Data Protection Bill of 2019. After that bill received a huge amount of pushback from industry giants, um, especially in the tech space. And whilst we've been here before, um, in as much as that original bill appeared to be on the cusp of being ratified multiple times, we do hear that this new bill is due to be heard in the monsoon session of Parliament starting on the 17th of July. And we're going to be watching again that progress. Now, this bill is the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill, um, and it didn't really create the same splash as the original 2019 bill. Um, and so we were quite interested in kind of trying to figure out why that would be the case and how potentially this new bill impacts background screening, as the original 2019 bill would have had a massive impact on how um, we went about um, processing data. Now, the Digital Protection Bill, this one that was issued in um, November, is definitely much more limited in scope. 
And so we don't think immediately it's going to impact checks that we currently carry out in India. And that's because the bill applies only to data that's collected online or data that's collected offline when those records are then digitized immediately. Non-automated processing is also excluded from the purview of the bill. So because most records in India remain undigitized, it is really difficult to see how this bill is actually going to apply right now. However, we did have a kind of quick sort of come by R around what, what are we currently doing and what kind of checks are there out there as we're certainly always trying to use technology um, and um, uh, to, to try and speed up processes in India because they are notoriously slow because you have to do so many physical ver verifications. And there are certain checks such as e-courts that use things like scrapers that may well fall within the definitions contained in the digital personal data bill. And so we do need to review all of those methodologies. We also look closely at the definition of automation under this new bill, and it is quite broad. So we think that it might include some processing that perhaps we wouldn't traditionally under the GDPR or UK GDPR consider to be automation. So again, we'd need to review that quite carefully. In any event, in much the same way um, as we just discussed around Africa, um, to, in order to push the digitization of records, you do need to have robust privacy laws. And this law is certainly designed to encourage that digitization and back that digitization up by having a framework in place. So the impact on um, background screening is definitely going to be felt in time. So we thought it'd be quite interesting to just have a look and see, given that we are going to be impacted by this eventually, exactly what would impact us. So there's lots that's familiar already. So um, providing notice of processing, individual rights, data breach notifications, fines, um, and anyone who's prepared for UK GDPR or GDPR or any um, legislation that's established outside of those two, two um, frameworks will be quite used to dealing with this by now. So we'll be quite well prepared. But one of the most interesting and most um, discussed aspects of the new bill is around the lawful grounds of processing. And because the new bill, unlike the 2019 bill, only considers consent, which also includes something called deemed consent, as a ground of processing personal data, which on the face of it seems super limiting. Now, what that deemed consent is, is essentially all of the um, lawful grounds of processing that we're used to seeing as separate grounds of processing in other legislation, all bundled up in something called the deemed consent. And the three that we thought were most interesting in context of background screening were there's going to be deemed consent if the processing relates to public interest, which can include information held in the public domain and credit scoring. Deemed um, consent if um, the processing is fair and reasonable, so that's kind of your legitimate interests. And then really importantly, um, deemed consent if, that's, if the purpose is related to employment and the legislation as drafted currently does include recruitment within that. So that all seems great. But reading that text, there does seem to be an awful lot of overlap and it isn't 100% clear how the deemed consent will actually work. Um, so, for example, most customers will have multiple components within their screening program. So, for example, if you wanted a civil credit report, which includes a um, credit score or a media search, which is public information, would that be deemed consent and have to be processed under the public interest um, limb of that deemed consent? Equally, if you also had criminal checks within that um, within that package, would that need to be processed under, for example, fair and reasonable purposes, or would it be purposes related to employment? Or can you at all times, regardless of what the, the, the deemed consent may state around, for example, public interest, can you, if it's employment related, can you just always, as a blanket rule, re um, rely on purposes related to employment? As I say, it, it really isn't clear, and it isn't clear um, whether employers, employers are going to have to have policies in place setting all of that out. In addition to that, it's if you've only got one ground of processing, um, consent or deemed consent, what happens if the candidate actually then withdraws their consent, which is a right under the bill? Does that actually mean that the deemed consent is withdrawn too? Again, that can't really be the intention, because if something's deemed, how do you withdraw deemed consent? Because it's just deemed to exist. Um, but there's no guidance on this point at the moment. So it may be that until that further guidance is issued, um, and actually we've probably got quite a lot of time to actually contemplate all of this, given that, again, most checks won't fall within the purview of this, this uh, bill because they're not digitised. Um, it may be that we want to just keep relying on specific consents for now until we understand a little bit more about how all of this will 
shake out. What we do know is that the bill is just going to be one piece of legislation and that there will be further regulations drafted in due course. So this is one area that we think quite likely will have um, separate regulations attaching to it. And to segue into our next update, we're also seeing some articles emerging discussing this bill and how it seems to present some difficulties from a compliance perspective um, in relation to the adoption of artificial intelligence, which seems a little strange given that the Indian government is really pushing um, organisations to adopt such technologies. And it actually goes back to the point we were just discussing, which is around consent and the lawful grounds for processing. So you clearly can't rely on explicit consent if you're using AI. So you'd have to rely on deemed consent under the current bill, and it's obviously going to be digital processing. But the deemed consent um, that would apply here is most likely going to be the fair and reasonable or legitimate interests limb of deemed consent. And that's drafted in a way that there are three, um, three sections to the test to show whether or not you do have that, that, that legitimate interest. And they're quite high bars to actually jump over. So it's going to be very difficult for businesses to be able to rely on that. So that's going to be something, I think, again, for folk to watch out for in India. And then our final um, compliance update is around emerging laws and artificial intelligence. Um, in 2023, I think as a privacy professional, it would be relatively unusual to wake up and not be greeted by an alert from a publication um, that's notifying us that some new guidance or white paper has been issued by a regulator in a jurisdiction. It's an absolutely massive topic and is hugely debated at the moment. But for the purposes of today, we're only going to focus on the relevant, relatively divergent way in which the UK and the EU are both approaching this topic. So both jurisdictions have stated that they want to ensure that business can innovate and utilise new technology whilst protecting personal data. And both also want to help regulators in this space strike a really good balance between those two things. Now, in the EU, that is coming in the form of the EU Artificial Intelligence Act. Now, that current draft splits artificial intelligence into three risk categories. Unacceptable risk, which means that would be absolutely banned. There's high risk, which would be highly regulated. And then A and other, which is kind of everything else. And the proposed legislation um, attempts to future-proof the law um, by inserting qu quite neutral requirements around technologies. Um, I think one of the lessons learned from the GDPR was that by the time um, it was um, in force, the intention to address the more digitized, technology-driven um, business world had kind of moved on because um, it took so long to come into force. So the idea behind this law is essentially to make it a little bit more flexible. But it being the EU, um, there is also um, there are also definitions um, alongside this flexibility um, about what um, high risk um, technologies are, and they're all set out in a specific annex, Annex One to that law. Um, included in the annex, and importantly for all of us on this webinar, um, is um, artificial intelligence systems um, that relate to employment, workers' management, and access to self-employment being those AI systems that are intended to be used for recruitment or the selection of individuals, notably advertising vacancies or making decisions on monitoring or evaluating workplace performance. An example of that for, uh, would be a CV scanning tool to assess applicants. Now, that high risk AI has mandatory requirements, which include having risk management systems in place, data and data governance, technical documentation, record keeping, transparency and human oversight. Now, most of those obligations actually sit with the provider, um, which is defined as the developer of the AI system. And they will additionally have to implement a quality management system and draw up technical documentation and keep logs and conduct conformity assessments. For all of you who would be deemed to be the users of the AI system, you will have limited obligations. And that will relate to monitoring and information obligations. Now, in the UK, we're taking a slightly different approach, um, and it tackles AI by firstly reviewing current laws in respect to automated decision making, and then considering the regulation of AI. So we need to go back to the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill number two. And under that bill number two, it is pro proposed that the provisions of Article 22 of the UK GDPR, which relate to automated decision making, are amended. 
Now, those amendments would replace the general prohibitions on the use of ADM and instead replace those with safeguarding provisions. So in other words, allowing organizations to use ADM provided that they safeguard um, individuals. And those safeguarding provisions are that data subjects have to be informed about decisions made, allow them to make representations about the decision, allow the data subject to ask for human intervention, and also allowing the data subject to consent to that decision. Now, the rationale behind those changes appears to be driven by the recognition that if the use of AI systems increases, then automated decision making is inevitable and the laws need to be able to facilitate organizations being able to make those automated decisions whilst again providing protections. So if you can't use automated decisions, AI becomes completely useless. In respect to AI, the UK government, um, supported by the ICO in its guidance, has stated in its AI policy paper that it's just not intending to introduce legislation at this stage in respect to AI. Instead, according to that paper, the focus is going to be on regulating the use of the AI systems in context um, that they're applied as opposed to regulating the technology itself. So we're going back to this idea of it being flexible, business friendly and a bit more pragmatic. Now, the current paper sets out broad principles, there's six of them, and they are that um, organizations have to ensure AI is used safely, it's technically secure and functions as designed, so it doesn't kind of try and take over the world. Um, it's appropriately transparent and explainable. It embeds considerations of fairness within it. It defines a legal per person's responsibility for AI governance and also clarifies routes to redress or contest. And those principles, unlike in the EU, where we've got a distinction between a provider and a user, are going to apply to any entity in that AI lifecycle where their activities create some form of risk. So with the UK and the EU taking for now really different paths, it's going to be super interesting to see how companies approach rolling out AI-based systems in both locations. And for now, it might just be easiest to comply with the most prescriptive legislation-based regime. Though again, I've been reading some articles that suggested that the UK, based on this policy paper, may become fertile ground for testing out new AI systems. So that's the compliance part over with. Um, and we're now going to look in more detail at our social media product. And we're looking at it because it's interesting from a compliance perspective, but also, of course, as a product, it's, it's using some bespoke AI. And so we thought it tied in quite nicely um, with the, the review there on the new laws. Now. Traditional background checks look at actions already taken by a candidate and provide great insight into skills and qualifications, as well as flagging up bad behaviours. But it's really the tip of the iceberg when you're looking to recruit. Today, as we focus on core values and corporate culture, it's equally important to give consideration to how that candidate fits within your organisation and team, as well as their qualifications to perform the role. And social media searches provide a much more holistic view of your candidate, giving you lots more information to base your hiring decisions upon. But I hear you cry. Don't adverse media checks already look at social media posts? Well, the answer is no, not at HireEye in any event. Adverse media checks have been around for a long time, but social media checks are quite new and understanding the difference between the two is super important. So adverse media checks, what are they? Well, they are looking at public media sources, so publications, news outlets, etc., that identify actions that have been taken by a candidate that are of a sufficiently adverse nature to have been reported in the public domain by a third party. Compared to that, the social media search focuses on behaviours of a candidate being those behaviours that a candidate has chosen to share publicly via their personal account on a social media platform. So why screen um, online behavior? I mean, it seems relatively clear looking at those first three bullet points. It helps you avoid bad hires. It reduces your reputational risk and, of course, consequently avoids any PR disasters. And in addition, social media checks, if used on an ongoing basis, can help you monitor behaviors that otherwise might be risked by your risk teams. And that provides that additional protection of your top talent. We even have some stats to back this all up. So there was a cornerstone survey conducted pre-COVID that found that just one employee out of 20 in a team that exhibited toxic behaviour, so that's just 5% of your team, could lower productivity within the team by up to 40% and with 54% of the remaining team being more likely to leave. 
So the collateral damage of this finding is, of course, lost time, increased costs, whether those are hiring costs, potential costs relating to claims in the workplace, and of course, a serious impact on corporate culture and morale and starting your teams again, which is always difficult, especially if people are relying on new hires to take up some slack within that team. But back to the question of why use social media, which might seem a little bit risky when you can already look for bad behavior on social media. So you can see on the, I think, right hand side of the slides, we've given some real life examples um, of some social media um, activity that was reported and why we think it's important that you would do adverse media and social media checks. So those um, examples are a cricketer who uses Twitter account to tweet crass comments. The soccer ace who was filmed kicking a cat instead of a football with that film going, being posted to social media and then the fashion house whose garments languished in the half off section of Nordstrom after some um, posts on social media that were um, not savoury. So I think the first point to make about all this is that um, these examples were all widely reported in the press, so adverse media. But the origin of the stories were actually on social media and the only reason they went viral and were reported was due to the high profile of the posters. So if you're thinking about employing Stefano Gabbana, then an adverse media post was likely going to do the trick. But most of the individuals that you're hiring are not going to be tabloid or broadsheet fodder. However, if you use a social media search, depending on your search terms and more of that on the next slide, these stories would be picked up or these behaviours would be picked up. And that brings me to the second point, which, which is contextualizing any reported actions. So in the case of the two sporting stars, these were one-off acts of total idiocy, um, whereas the fashion house had form and similar posts were found in their, their, their history and were reported in the press. Now, if the searches are conducted only via adverse media, what the employer sees is kind of a snapshot. So they see the report of the adverse action of the candidate. But if you add social media, either you can do that at the time of the screening, so all doing it at the same time, or perhaps adding it on once an adverse media um, um, result comes back, then that action can actually be further reviewed by placing those actions in context. And that allows an employer to actually evaluate the risk of hire. So for example, is it a repeated behavior, as in the case of Dodge and Gabbana, um, and therefore one that doesn't align to the core values of the hiring organization, making that individual a hiring risk, or is it a one-off behavior that can actually be managed and monitored and an acceptable risk at the time of hire? And actually, as an aside, the search can also assist organizations in relation to ongoing monitoring. And as we mentioned a little bit earlier, that can be um, for your high-risk roles and monitoring behaviors um, that, that need to be picked up. Um, so for example, you know, identifying if um, somebody in your finance team is suddenly um, living the high life when they perhaps shouldn't be based on their salary and flagging that, uh, that being flagged within the security risk teams and that behavior then being monitored, or actually even for your non-risk roles. And we talk about this a little bit in context of ESG and wellbeing programs. So you can use social media pro um, programs to actually look for behaviors that will then allow teams to identify if pastoral support is actually needed, or potentially even um, identifying if somebody's having a hard time within the workplace, within a team, because somebody else is exhibiting behaviors that are not, um, are not um, aligned with those core values. It allows you to intervene. So we've established that the social media check can be a good idea, but here's the thing. Most recruiters kind of do them anyway by virtue of the uh, Google search on the down low. So why on earth would you surface that fact to can candidates? Uh, what are the benefits of the social media search? Well. A quick search to see if your candidate has posted anything can work as a one-off, but it's definitely not scalable. Um, there's a vast amount of information out there and manually searching thousands of online so sources is really impossible to do quickly and accurately. It would take huge teams to complete the work and that means steep operating costs. And additionally, manual screening can leave companies vulnerable to errors and worse, allegations of unconscious bias when you're making decisions. The high right social media search is designed instead to quickly identify those problematic behaviors for potential hires or current employees by analyzing that publicly available social media profile using both automation and human analysis. For, the t for those searches to be really genuinely successful, technology has to be used to ensure that robust and exhausted search is conducted. And AI is then used to analyze categories and keywords for job relevant information.
that then is all checked by a team of human analysis and analysts um, to um, review the results found to ensure that accuracy. So how do you make it compliant? The third most frequently asked question after don't we do this already in adverse media and why bother when I can do a quick Google? And also, how do we make sure that candidates are all OK with this? Because it's a bit daunting for a candidate to suddenly think that their social media profile is going to be looked at. So starting right at the beginning, the most important thing to be aware of with this product is that the social media search only accesses public social media posts and it does not access or try to access any private social media. If I, as a user of social media, want to make my posts public, I can do, but equally I can restrict or access all views and keep what I want private. And where I've chosen to do that, then that should be respected. And so there will never be a request for passwords um, for accounts that will just never happen. So having satisfied yourself that nobody's kind of, you know, scraping the dark web or doing anything they shouldn't be and hacking into people's um, private social media accounts, the first task of the employer um, when they're assessing whether they want to use this type of check is whether or not that check is relevant and proportionate in context of your business, its unique risk profile and the roles that you're hiring. And the answer to that question may be absolutely yes for some roles and for others not so much. So once you've kind of established that at a super high level, your next step is to formalise that and carry out a proper risk assessment and categorise those roles into those that do carry risk and those that don't. And a flexible screening program is going to allow you to build packages around all of those different risk profiles to address those risks and allow you to adopt a good level of granularity. And that's important so that you can demonstrate to candidates that you're not taking a one size fits all to this type of, of check. And it certainly helps if you, you, you need to um, defend any actions. Once you've got that sorted, you can look on to what you want to search or perhaps a better way of looking at it is what you don't want to search. And high right social, social media search does filter out those protected characteristics and class information and does focus solely on job relevant information. And as we've mentioned, does that quickly and efficiently by using AI software that reads texts and images like a human and analyzes for that job relevancy. Two things to note here that are super important. Firstly, what's relevant to the job is absolutely down to you as the employer. And we're gonna look on the final slide, which you'll be pleased to know is coming up very soon. Um, in relation to how you can build out that program. And the second is utilizing technology in this space significantly reduces your risk as an employer. We've mentioned these manual searches and frequently when you are conducting a manual search you'll inadvertently uncover information that's entirely irrelevant and illegal to use in employment decisions. And that can be race, religion, sexual orientation, political affiliation, or anything else that actually probably shouldn't come up. It's somebody's private life. So, you know, um, maybe you shouldn't take it into account when you're making a decision. And it then becomes really difficult to prove that that information isn't used in employment decisions. Even when a decision maker intends to ignore anything that they've come across inadvertently, that information can subconsciously bias you. And organizations such as the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and the UK's Equality and Human Rights Commission do assume that if public online content has been accessed, it's being used. So you've satisfied yourself that you've, you've, you've kind of sorted out your risk roles, you know you want to do the screening, you're kind of on the cusp of, of sort of building your program. You also need to find a partner. Um, and we all suggest that you would find a partner that has privacy compliance built into its DNA. So that once that order's placed, you have the comfort that the process itself, including how that check's communicated to the candidate, is compliant and I may be a bit biased but I think high right would be a good choice here but the things to look out for generally are transparency in notifying the candidate about the nature of the search that's being conducted a good partner will not simply list that social media searches are conducted it will include information that outlines what's involved and highlights that only public posts will be reviewed and that the parameters of the search have been set by the employer as relevant for the job that's being sought that way, the obligations are fully informing the candidate as to the nature and reasoning behind the processing are fulfilled. But importantly, it has the knock-on effect of giving that transparency and comfort to the candidate, but allowing them space to ask questions around the process if they want to, before they, before they provide any personal data or any processing begins. You then want to make sure that your partner has system functionality that provides an audit trail of all of that, so that you can show that the candidate was informed about the check 
and that they've also acknowledged that the employer has the lawful ground for processing that check. You want to also make sure that data is stored, retained, transferred and accessed in accordance with requirements under various laws and that adequate technical and security measures are in place. And thinking about this in context of, of, of sort of EMEA, particularly the EU, you want to make sure that your partner is able to store and process that data using teams based out of the EU and storing that data either in, in the EU or within an adequate country, especially in context of the scrutiny around data transfers at the moment. So, for example, if you're posting on social media, as we know from Schrems, um, there's an objection to that data going back to the US. So don't use a, a provider who is constantly um, transferring that data back to the US. You also want to make sure that your, your partner has um, policies and procedures in place that support you in supporting candidates if they wish to exercise their rights, whether that's access, rectification, deletion of data, or withdrawing their consent or objecting to the processing. You want to make sure that those results are appropriately filtered and that they're reported adequately. So using two identifiers to ensure accuracy and again, limiting reporting to what's job relevant. You also might want to limit the period in which you um, um, ask for results to be reported. So the standard is around seven years, but that can be reduced, especially if you're looking at a grad populace, because really we probably can't be held responsible for what we might post either at university or maybe when we're a little bit younger. And then finally, you want to make sure that your partner is, is using um, a search that utilizes all of the technology available, but importantly has a human at the end of the process that checks the matches and ensures quality. And going back to the review of the um, EU um, Artificial Intelligence Act, that last piece is going to be super critical when deployed in the EU based off those mandatory requirements we discussed. So with all of that in place, you can then concentrate on building out your program. And this is our final slide. So to help you get this right, HireRight offers two main configuration options, standard and advanced. And those configurations allow you to identify risk-creating behaviors that relate to harassment, violence, intolerance, and crime under the standard configuration with the option of an additional um, category of substance abuse, meaning drug and alcohol, and the advanced configuration. And that advanced configuration is often used by companies in set verticals where understanding any substance abuse is important. So for example, healthcare and transportation. And the aim is to highlight content that may introduce a toxic work environment or present a brand risk, or actually present a real actual risk um, in your provision of services. And so, um, you know, anyone who's um, off their head um, on drugs or alcohol and um, probably shouldn't be driving a train, for example, um, however, there is a more custom approach that's also available in respect to the search. And considering the nature of our privacy and employment laws, it is recommended that customers take that custom approach. So if you do customize, you can further tailor the search criteria under the standard and advanced options by using keywords. And that allows you much more granularity and allows even greater compliance with the legislation. So you can absolutely ensure that protected characteristics are pre-filtered and don't appear in the results. But even more importantly, you can use specific keywords, address specific risks associated with specific roles. So that means you can actually have a social media check uh, tailored to each of your different distinct risk categories or in fact, non-risk categories. And you, again, you can demonstrate to any regulator or an individual who's being screened that you've gone through all the proper processes and assessed whether or not assess that reasonableness and proportionality. So finally, the last question we get is, do you actually get any hits if you only look at public posts? Well, we actually do. On average, we get a one in 10 hit rate per customer defined criteria. And most of those hits wouldn't be picked up in an adverse media post. So if we go back to the core proposition around this product, which is analyzing behaviors that impact corporate culture and reputation, the hit rate does show that it's important to conduct a social media check um, if you are going to hire. Because it means that not only the folk who you've established are good on paper um, are going to be hired, but also that if they're good on paper, they're going to be great in person too and add real value to your organization. So that concludes the presentation. Thanks for sticking with me because uh, that was an awful lot of information. Um, I was going to say it's your turn to ask some questions, but it looks like we're quite um, close to the hour. But I don't know if we can fit one in. If we can, um, Anne will let us know. If not, we will um, answer questions in writing. Yeah, I was just going to say we're at the top of the hour. Um, so I've got the questions and we'll follow up afterwards with those. Um, but yeah, let's... Uh, 
close this one out and thank you so much caroline for that um and there will be emails coming out with the link to the recording for everybody if they want to go back over it um thank you very much everybody for joining today